This is a podcast of Forest Lake Baptist Church Sermons. If you'd like to know more about our church, visit our Facebook page or our website at flbc.org.au. We hope you're blessed by this message. Today we've got a guest speaker, Michael Keefe from Compassion. We, uh, we love the work of Compassion. And I read this this week, a quote by um, a great Christian from a thousand years ago, Augustine of Hippo, who said this, So anyone who thinks that he has understood the divine scriptures or any part of them, but cannot by this understanding build up this double love of God and neighbor, he has not yet succeeded in understanding them. The more we understand God, the more we'll be moved to love. And that's why we have Sundays like Compassion Sunday, when we can express the love of Jesus to people we may never meet. So can you put your hands together and welcome Michael Keefe from Compassion. Well, good morning, everyone. You hear me now? It's great to be here with you this morning, and thank you so much for having me. And um, 26 years is is a great thing as a church, um, to be in a community for that long. Um, And as I was, uh, I've visited here a few times, but as I was sitting here this morning, I'm like, I really feel at home here. Like, there's no, uh, I'm not saying lots of churches are pretentious, but there's no pretense here. There's no show here that's just, we love Jesus, we worship him, we want to reach our community. That's what I feel. A real good saltiness, salt salt that brings flavor to the community. And so I just, yeah, I just wanted to say that because I feel that as I'm here this morning and um, feel quite at home uh, with you this morning. And, and it's great to come together and worship Jesus together this morning. Um, it's a real honor to be able to share about the ministry of compassion and share out of the word of God with you this morning. I'm just going to put that down there. Uh, for those of you who have not met me before, I was here last year and uh, previously have been here uh, before as well. Um, I'm married to my beautiful wife, Amanda. We have a big blended family of eight children um, in our home. So we came together when we got married uh, a number of years ago with six children already. And then we've had two little bubs in the last few years who are now toddlers, um, two and a half and one and a half. Layla's the youngest at 18 months. And um if I nod off during my own sermon this morning, she's the reason why. Um, last night she was, uh, no, she, she decided lately she doesn't want to sleep in her cot anymore. She wants to be in with mummy and daddy. Um, and I've been working at Compassion for over a decade now, and I love this ministry and love being a part of it and getting to um, speak up for children all around the world who need someone to speak up for them. I want to start this morning by celebrating with you that there are 51 children, uh, Compassion children, sponsored by people who families who are uh, part of the the Forest Lake Baptist Church family. And so I just want to say thank you to, to you for that. 51 children, that's, that's fantastic. That is so good. Those kids are connected and loved by a local church. Um, they're being released from poverty in Jesus' name. They're going there every week and they're, they're not having to wonder where their next food meal is going to come from or they're not going to have to worry about whether the water they drink is clean. They're, no, they're not no longer having to worry about whether they can go to school or not. Their parents are no longer having to go... Our kids are sick, but we can't take them to the doctors because through the partnership with the local church with Compassion, that has changed for them. And they're hearing about the love of Jesus through their local church as well. So thank you so much for your support and sponsorship. I met a number of you this morning already telling me uh, how you sponsor children with Compassion. And and so thank you so much for that. I just want to throw one number, I could throw a lot of numbers at you um, in terms of poverty, but I just want to give you one and it's this number, 333 million. That's the number of children globally who live in extreme poverty right now. Not just poverty, but extreme poverty, the the, the worst kind of poverty. Um, basically, half the number of people in the world who are in extreme poverty are kids. Kids are affected the most and disproportionately by extreme poverty. And they have no choice whether they're born into it. They're just born into it. And without help, they'll be stuck in it. And the cycle of poverty will perpetuate itself. People like my friend, if we can go to the next slide, Richmond from Uganda. Uh, if that slide comes up in a second, uh, Richmond, who is on the left over there. Um, for Richmond, um, he wouldn't go to school, couldn't go to school each day because they couldn't afford it in Uganda. And he would wait by the side of the road with his siblings. They would walk around the slum or walk up to the side of the road and wait and hope that bananas would fall off the back of a truck and he could run and grab them and have something to eat that day. That was his reality. Or you've got Meski here from Indonesia who works so hard as a fisherman, but it's just not enough. I can't imagine 
as a husband and as a dad, doing everything I can and it not being enough. Trying your very hardest. Kids who are in the service this morning, whoever gets in trouble for opening the fridge and standing there and leaving the fridge open too long. Because you're just looking for food. Yep, you get uh, something. There's a few adults putting their hands up as well. Because you go, it happens in our house. They go and they open the fridge and they stand there and they look for ages. They've only been in there 30 seconds ago, but they're looking again, hoping something else has magically appeared. Or they'll go to the pantry and they'll say this. And the kids in our house will say this. They'll say, "Is there anything good to eat?" Which is code for, "Is there any junk food?" And in our house, when the kids open the fridge too long, especially in summer, we tell them, "Close the fridge." Think about what you want to eat, open the fridge, grab it, and close the fridge again. And there's always food in our fridge and in our pantry. And our kids, the kids in our house, eat a lot of food. I don't know if you kids have eaten a lot these school holidays, always wanting to be fed. Kids in our house eat a lot of food. But it would be really sad. I would miss getting our kids in just a little bit of trouble. Not that I don't get in big trouble for it, just a little bit of trouble for doing that if there was no food in the fridge and there was no food in the pantry. I couldn't imagine that because no matter how much they eat, we can always, we always have the ability and resource to go and get more food and put it in the pantry. And the vast, vast, vast majority of us in Australia can do that without even giving it a thought. But here's the good news. Compassion's doing amazing work in these countries all around the world to make sure that these kids don't stay in extreme poverty. Compassion's been around for over 70 years, now work in 29 countries, and there's over 2.3 million children in Compassion's program worldwide. So who is Compassion? I don't want to assume everyone here knows about Compassion. So we've got three C's that are really easy to help you remember. We're Christ-centered, we're child-focused, and we're church-based. Christ-centered means that we're unapologetically on about Jesus. And every child in the program gets a Bible, gets to hear the gospel every week, um, and has an opportunity to to know Jesus like we all do. I don't want to assume you might not you might be here this morning and not know Jesus, and hopefully um, you want to go on a journey of of learning about him and finding to know him. But for these kids, they get to hear about Jesus, and so do their families every week. We're child focused, and so what that means is we we start with the needs of kids. We know if we can help kids before malnutrition kicks in, before their years behind in their schooling, uh, before poverty has created a real sense of hopelessness in their life that they will be the last ones to be in their family line to be in poverty. The cycle of poverty will break with them. And we're church-based. So every Compassion Project all around the world is based out of a local church. Uh, 8,700 of them now um, in all those countries. And if you get to go and visit a Compassion Project, it's an amazing thing to do. But you actually won't see a Compassion sign anywhere. You'll just actually go and visit a local church who's being the hands and feet of Jesus in that community. And so for these kids, every week they go there for eight to 10 hours a week and they get to have fun. They get to eat great food and they get to have food go home for their family. They get to worship together and be taught about Jesus. Um, They get supported with their schooling and their education. They get health checkups um, and they just get to be kids and have fun, which is cannot, I don't want to understate that one because that one's just as important for kids living in extreme poverty. And so today I just want to encourage you in that in child sponsorship. We're going to get into the Word of God in a second, um, but I just want to encourage you in the opportunity to sponsor children. Uh, The financial commitment uh, is $48 a month. It's been that for a a long, long time. Some of you who are existing supporters may have got an email this week uh, in the past week telling you it's about to go up to $55 a month, um, which it will for the first time in over a decade um, go up to try and I guess, make sure that what we can give the kids goes as far. It doesn't go as far as it used to, um, to make sure that it does um, go far enough for these kids. Um, But the sign up today, if you do sign up today, it's still at $48 a month. When you sign up today, we're just in that tricky period where it's about to change. Um, As our family, we we have the privilege and honor to to sponsor three children. and, And to be honest, it doesn't hurt us to do that. We don't miss that. We're not wealthy by Australian standards. We're very wealthy by global standards. But by Australian standards, we're not wealthy. And most of us in this room are not wealthy by Australian standards. But by global standards, we are. And it's the equivalent of a few takeaway coffees a week or a small fast food meal a week or once a month going to the movies. 
Well, about the cost of three streaming subscriptions for a month. Some of us have three or some of us might have more than three streaming subscriptions per month. Um, it's not something that for us hurts and for most Australians to sponsor a child or even multiple children is not something that financially hurts. For a handful of people, and that may be you, it would be a real stretch and I absolutely acknowledge that. Um, but for the kids living in poverty, it's it's absolutely life-changing. And so today, we've got a number of children from um, one region in Indonesia, um, or two regions, sorry, in Indonesia who need sponsorship. This is Rooney. He is uh, 10 years old. He's been waiting 140 days for a sponsor. Um, if you wanted to sponsor Rooney after the service, you come to the table, um, you pick him up, you can read about him on the back, um, and then you just take a moment to scan the QR code, and it takes a few minutes just to fill that out and, and commit to sponsoring Rooney or another child. People ask me all the time when they come to the table, can I just, can I take this and do it at home? And the answer is yes, but I would encourage you to try and do it today on the spot because people who do it on the spot, 100% success rate of following through. People who take it home, I'll be honest, all well-intentioned, but it sits at about 50 or 60% of people actually follow through when they take it home. So if you've got like five minutes max, that's all that will take um, if you'd like to sponsor a child today. If you really have to rush out, like really have to, you can take one home and that's okay. Or if you need to go home and talk to your spouse who's not here today about it, I, I completely understand that. Um, and we can set you up to do that as well. But thank you again so much for your support and sponsorship. Uh, I'm just going to share out of the Word of God for the next few minutes. Um, and um, Mel, the passage, I don't know if you're still here in the building. I can't, oh, there you are. Hello. Um, picked is very appropriate today. Um, we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 18, and it's called The Child in the Midst. And I'll read this to you. It says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I was going to play a video in between there, but I'm going to play it at the end now because I've got into this, so uh, we'll play it at the end. So the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This is one of a number of encounters that Jesus has with children. And they're hinting of themselves, they're jostling for position, they're, they've got some pride going on, and, and Jesus knows this, and he responds to their pride by calling over a child and placing a child right in the middle of them. The King James Version actually says he places a child in the midst of them. One of the things when I read accounts in Scripture is I try and put myself there and I go, all right, who was this child? Who, wh like, why did Jesus pick this child and call this child over? And the reality is we don't know anything about this child or we don't know if this child was a really well-behaved child or if this child, you know, um, had some behavioral issues going on. We don't know if the child was, you know, an A or B student at school or struggling with their schoolwork or was the child healthy or was the child sick? Was the child creative or was the child a really structured child? Was the child outgoing and loved being the center of attention as Jesus pulled them over or was the child like freaking out you know kind of like oh don't don't pick me um you know it, it's like the the kid in class who doesn't want to be picked as the volunteer and the teacher calls them up and is freaking out was this child an only child or one of many we won't really know who this child was which I think is good because this child represents every child and Jesus calls this child over and places this child in the midst of them. And he says two things. Become like this child and welcome this child. Or make room for them. Do you know, In have you ever heard the saying, children are better seen and not heard? I don't like that saying. But it's a saying that, that's kind of a bit, it's not really a today saying. It's more from years ago. You know, seen and not heard. Just in the background, just, you know. And I'm all for children being polite. I'm not against that. But in Jesus' day, it was even more a case of seen and not heard. Like you're not even, you know, you're kind of not even like a real person yet. Like get, keep the children away. And multiple times the disciples tried to and keep the children, like Jesus is on about important adult stuff. Keep the kids, keep the kids away. 
And Jesus takes a child and places his child in the midst of them, which was culturally in that time, like, you just don't do that. And he says these things. Welcome, uh, become like this child and welcome this child or make room for this child. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Become like little children. He says, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're asking who the greatest is. And Jesus is like, unless you become like these little children, not only will you be not be the greatest, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven if you can't humble yourself and become like this. See, all the intellect in the world isn't going to save us. All the money in the world isn't going to save us. All the influence and power in the world isn't going to save us. All the trying to be a good person in the world isn't going to save us. What saves us is when we go, I'm a sinner. I fall way short of God. And I'm in desperate need of Jesus. That takes some humbling of ourselves. Sometimes life humbles us as well. But then we've got to choose to humble ourselves and say, I need Jesus. You might be sitting here going, yeah, I know that. I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. I'm not just talking about at the point of recognizing your need for salvation. That's, that's vital that we do that. But it's also every day. I can't do this. What he's asking me to do, I call him, I can't do this by myself. I desperately need Jesus today. Yes, I need Jesus to be saved. But I also need Jesus today. And Jesus is saying, unless if you want to know what the kingdom's all about, become like these little children who humble themselves. Now, Zoe is two and a half in our family. And Zoe has no qualms saying she needs daddy or mummy. Just no qualms about it. Sometimes it's dramatic. It's kind of like a, a foot to the ground and uh, up, up, pick me up. It's... I'm back. Okay. Sometimes we can be a little bit like that, dramatic. I bet you didn't expect the preacher to fall down on the stage this morning. A little bit dramatic like that. But you know what? Sometimes I'm a, as she gets older, I'm a little bit firm with her because sometimes it's just like crazy dramatic. But I still go and pick her up. I'm not going to leave her there forever. Sometimes even when we're, he still picks us up. It's just acknowledging kids are, are okay with, daddy, I need you. And it's okay. It's not a sign of weakness. <laughs> Father God, I need you. I'm really struggling with this today. I'm really struggling with this. Or, or and to, um, even at the start of it, going, I'm doing really good today, but God, I still don't want to do this myself. I need you. When it talks about coming like a child, it's take the lowly position. It's humble ourselves, to be ranked low, to bring down one's pride, to be modest in our opinion of ourselves. We need Jesus and we need each other. We need to acknowledge that we're not isolated. We need each other. I love kids the way they just approach other kids. There's just no, there's no pretense. It's just like, hey, you're another kid. You're about my size. Let's, we're friends. And it's just, let's, let's just go and talk to each other. And the older we get, I find, the harder that can be sometimes to admit that we need each other and we need help. Uh, we were upgrading the size of our car uh, about 18 months ago, which was needed. And we had this Ford Territory and the, the boot of it, um, it, it kind of, you can open the whole boot, you can just open the window part. And the window part, the hinge was a bit broken and, and had kind of half popped out because part of the hinge broke. And so it wouldn't stay shut. So it wasn't secure and we we're going to trade it in and, and, or sell it and get another car, which we have since done. And, um, I'm like to my wife, I just need to fix this so that it's done. I, th I, I think I know what I need to do. And she's like, okay, just don't, just don't break it. I think you know where this story's going. And I'm not a handyman. I have some talents and I have some skills, but handyman is not me. I, I've got other talents and skills that God gave me. My dad's a handyman, so there's a part of me that wants to live up to because dad can kind of fix everything. Part of me that wants to live up to that. And so I walk out there and I'm just like, I just need to tap it back in, the hinge bit back in. And I'm like, this bit's separate from the glass. I should be fine. And I go out there with a hammer and my wife's like, Michael, just 
just mate, I'm like, I, it's all good. It was, it was full of pride. I'm, I actually, I desperately needed help with that, but I chose to be full of pride. And tap, 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 and next thing, psh, glass everywhere shattered in thousands of little pieces. I have to admit, I didn't behave very Christ-like in that moment. The hammer went flying into the garden. And I'm like, oh, like that was a, and my wife was very gracious towards me. She did not, there wasn't an ensuing fight. There wasn't even an I told you so, because I think she could feel the gravity that I felt. I just, I was too full of pride. And Jesus is saying in this, let's humble ourselves and become like little children who are not afraid to ask for help. Firstly, from him. And secondly, from each other. Because when we do that, it's a really beautiful thing. When we're dependent on him and in, not, not in an unhealthy way, but working together and dependent on each other in a healthy way, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the second thing in this passage is he says, welcome the little children or make room for them. Represents children, but also represents so much more. Represents those without standing, those without influence or prominence, the poor, the blind, the lame. Jesus talks over and over and over again in the Gospels about welcoming those who really can give you nothing in return. Who really have nothing else to offer you. In fact, one time in, in the Gospel of Luke, he actually says that. He says, when you have a dinner, not if, but when you have a dinner, invite the poor and the blind and the lame. In Matthew 25, he talks about when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. And he's like, when did, when did we do that, these people? And they're like, when you did it to the least of these, like the little children. He talks of physical needs, but also spiritual and relational needs. I won't go through it all in detail this morning for time's sake, but the last one in, about prison, it's like when... I was in prison, you visited me. I love it doesn't say, when I was in prison, you came and told me off for what I did to get there. It doesn't say, oh, I, I, I came along and I tried to bust you out. You visited me. You're just present. There's something just about being present with people in their lives. Something about that with children. Some of the things that kids just want most is our attention. People just want to be heard and listened to. My wife's amazing at this. Um, she can just take the pulse of our kids and know what's kind of needed. Uh, there was a week uh, last year where, uh, late last year, where the, it'd just been a big week. There'd been lots going on. The kids, everyone's a bit, you know, on edge and tired. And it's the end of the week. And she just looks at me and she just says, just go with, just go with this. I'm like, okay. And she goes, everyone in the car now, let's go. Who wants Slurpees? And everyone piles in the car and in the van and they're all in, the, in there. And my wife decides to sit in the back seat, which she hates doing, but she knew one of the kids would love to sit up the front seat. And so she sits in the back. And then as we're driving, she starts this chant, IGA, IGA. And all the kids are screaming IGA, which they know means they're going to get to spend like two or $3 each at IGA buying lollies or whatever. And it was just something that in that moment, our children needed. And we went and got Slurpees and... IGA, I don't know, it might have cost us $25 or something. And it just lifted their spirits and it just created a fun going into the whole weekend. And it was just understanding what they needed and just being present with them in that moment. I know that today's Compassion Sunday and we're talking about sponsoring children and I definitely want you to do that. But I don't want this to be just about that today. I want this to be about the children in your world, your own children your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, your neighbor's kids, your friend's kids, and the people in your world who are just in a position where they have nothing to offer you and are less fortunate than you, or the kids that work in the workplace, or, or, or the person, kids, for you kids, it's for you guys, it's the, it's the kid who doesn't have very many friends at school, who sits by themselves, who could do with you coming over and being around them, making a little bit of room for them. I talked about my friend Richmond before. Um, he's actually coming to Australia in November. But Richmond, um, I don't have time to tell you his whole life story right now. But when he was very young, and I won't go into the detail um, today, but when he was very young, he'd lost his dad and his mum. And he had uh, six, there were six children. He was one of six kids. 
and they go to Nuguru Slum in Uganda because they can no longer afford to live where they were and they're tr- thrust into extreme poverty and mum is grieving and, and not doing well and they're living in a room that is three metres by three metres. Kids, I don't know who has to share a bedroom, but I bet you don't have to share it with seven people in a three metre by three metre room. Dirt floor, holes in the roof, so when it rains in the tin roof and dirt floor, they just pick up their possessions and they have to stand all night. I love it when it rains at night. It's awesome. You sleep and you're under the covers and it's so it was a nice for each and his family. And they, they're huddling in the corner and in the midst of all this poverty, um, Richmond's mum noticed a boy called Arthur who was across the, the kind of pathway in the slum. And Arthur's dad was no longer with them and his mum had left and Arthur was all by himself. Really, really tragic circumstances. And in the midst of her grief, in the midst of their extreme poverty, Richmond's mum walks over to Arthur and says, Arthur, come with me. You're one of my children now. And Richmond kind of looks at his mum. He's like, like mum, I don't, I, I don't mean to judge. And I'm not trying to stop you being generous, but have you noticed we don't have enough food already? And mum, have you noticed we don't have enough room already? And Richmond says he never, ever forgot these words that his mum said. She looked at him and she, she said, Richmond, there's always room. In the midst of her extreme poverty, she made room. And I wonder for us, who can we make room for in our lives? A little bit more. Sometimes we go on, uh, our current generation, uh, I mean all of us, I'm talking about a specific generation within, but everyone who's like, well, we talk about being so time poor. But I wonder who we can make room for. You think you're time poor? Have a look at your screen time on your phone. Maybe you're not as time poor as you think. Or who could we make a little bit of financial room for to, to bless and to give towards? Who would make time just to listen, just for two minutes? Sometimes is all it takes that someone needs to be heard. Or just a little thing of encouragement to come alongside a child. I remember, I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish now, I'm out of time, but I remember when I was 17 years old, I'd just been backslidden and I'd just come back to Christ. And our youth group at the time went to to speak in another, went to go and help minister to another church. And I was asked to get up and give my testimony of walking away from Christ and coming back to him. And I'd never done any public speaking before and I'm nervous. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of standing up there and the pulpit's shaking because this hand's going and the microphone's going like this. And I shared my testimony of walking away and coming back to Christ. And, um, and I went and sat down and there was a man that came with us that day. He drove us drove us on the bus there. There was, there was only about 15 of us, but he drove the bus. His name's Trevor. He was the dad of a couple of other boys in the youth group. And he was sitting next to me. Trevor's never done any public speaking in his life. Trevor doesn't have any prominent ministry that, that people will notice. Not that one ministry is more important than the other because it's really not. But I sat down next to him. And I'm like, I got no idea how I just did, whether I did good or not. I just, and Trevor didn't even say a word. He just kind of did a little fist pump. So this 17-year-old, that fist pump spoke more word, more than a whole bunch of words would ever speak. It was basically a, a nod of the head and a fist pump. Well done. And I grew about 10 foot tall in that moment. Sometimes that's all it takes. And so today my challenge for you is welcome, oh, sorry, become like little children. Let's humble ourselves for our need of Jesus and our need of each other. And let's make room for the children. And that's just not children in age, but anyone that we can help who's vulnerable, who needs it, who we can come alongside. You know, I know I, I'm here for compassion today. And look, I would love for every, I've got 30 child profiles. I'd love for them to all, for the table to be cleared today. I don't think it's probably possible. I don't know if it'll happen. We'll just see. I'd love for you guys to come and take them. But if that's all that happened, and you didn't walk out of here in some way challenged about your everyday life, I'd be sad. I'd be disappointed. Because this isn't just about in one area. This is not an either or. It's an and both that this would capture our hearts when we go, who can I walk alongside this week? Who in my life, and I just want you to take a moment and close your eyes right now. I go, who in my life can I welcome and walk alongside this week? Because the impact of that in their life can be so much I know it has been for me I know it is for others and you have the opportunity to do that too Father thank you for the opportunity 
to be known and loved by you, to admit that we need you. And then, Lord, for you to choose us to help welcome others. What an honour. Move on our hearts as we do that this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.